Okay, so I'm gonna start the recording of the session. I'm gonna ask all the panelists and the attendees uh, on the video to uh, switch the video off. And then I will ask Elena as soon as I finish to come back on. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for uh, coming on board uh, this webinar. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of details on what's gonna happen today very quickly. We have a very tight schedule. Uh, we have started these webinars to help the space sector during the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown and, and, and uh, pandemic. It is to support the sector as a whole. And how do we proceed today? Uh, so we have a, a great webinar uh, a panel today uh on a topic of the space sector in africa thanks to uh vda uh, a, a legal firm in portugal uh, we have set up this panel we'll take about one hour of a presentation from the panel then we're going to have a 10 to 15 minutes discussion between the panelists and then uh 10 to 15 minutes of q a at the very end so the questions from those attending the panel uh can be uh asked using your screen at the very bottom of the screen you if you go with your mouse you'll see a q a box if you can uh, ask a question on that q a box uh, very short and very uh, succinct, succinct question please uh, no need to raise your hand please uh, we will not call on people to raise raise the hand so just ask your q a uh, question on the q a box everyone will be muted unless they will be call, called upon so um, I would like to thank uh, Veira de Almeida, who's a, a legal firm in Portugal for sponsoring the webinar. Uh, and also here's our lineup of the panelists today. Temidayo Onyosun, uh, founder of Space Africa, Space in Africa. Mag Magda Coco, head of practice at VDA. Edwina Teodoro from Angola, from the Angola National Space Program Management Office. Brian Jackins, uh, Intersa South Africa office, and myself as your host. We will also like to uh, present Elena uh, Mendoza, uh, who is also from VDA, who is going to present the panel. And also thanks to Marta Grasa, who has helped me to organize the panel that we have today. Um, so, uh, uh, over the past uh, 12 weeks, we had uh, many uh, presenters and panels since the beginning of, of, of April each week uh, and this is a, a week number 12 with the space in africa panel uh next week and the week after we are preparing for those panels as well um also uh this is the most uh, registered panel with the most registered people for the first time the united states has actually uh, surpassed the uk in terms of presence and of course we have many many uh, new uh people attending from 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 all over the world including africa a lot of people from africa are now have registered as well and uh, Middle East as well, and uh, Asia, uh, a lot of people coming. <coughs> so here is the uh, uh, history of the attendance, uh, registration and, and attendance. About 50, 60% of those who are registered usually attend uh, the panel. Uh, the type of attendees to this panel and uh, the type of uh, um, uh, titles of, of, of this panel, you can see from this chart. I'm not going to go in details on this. You're going to receive this presentation uh, tomorrow, most likely tomorrow. Uh, the Access Space Alliance, and you're most welcome to ask uh, more information to myself. And also, if you'd like to join afterwards, just let me know. Uh, Betty Bonardel, myself, and Christian are the directors of the Access Space Alliance. We are going to formalize the alliance, and also uh, we're going to have members uh, coming on board uh, uh, proper um, formal members coming on board uh, very, very soon. The existing um, uh, pledge of the Access Space Alliance is on this sheet of paper. You will uh, receive it and read it when I, um, when I send you the presentation. Uh, existing members as of April 2020 are on this chart. We have about 76, but since then we have uh, integrated another 10. Uh, the, the membership is uh, basically split between one third from the UK, one third from Europe, 
about 20% from the United States and about 10% from the remaining of the world. Uh, also, um, I'm just uh, promoting uh, uh, opportunities in the space sector where there could be uh, internship opportunities or, or job opportunities. Please let me know and I can, I can let people that are in search of those opportunities know that you are uh, in search of, uh, of uh, professional people that can actually work for you. I'm gonna now hand over the presentation to Helena. And Helena, if you can share your screen, and pull up your microphone and also video as well. Thank you, Helena. Okay, thank you so much, Tony. And uh, welcome everybody. Um, so I, I am a lawyer also from VDA, as Tony was saying. So a law firm with headquarters in Portugal, but also uh, throughout VDA legal partners with offices in several African countries. And uh, throughout our work in space and ICT matters, um, we, of course, realize that Africa and African countries are taking huge steps in the space sector. Um, as you know, the African Union approved a few years ago an African policy and strategy and is setting up uh, an African space agency in Egypt. And several countries are also uh, making uh, uh, huge steps and taking huge steps in, in this area, either by launching satellites, developing you know, joint projects with CubeSats, uh, investing and developing policies and laws. And so we thought it would be very interesting, uh, both for uh, companies and the entities that want to invest in Africa and both for African companies and the entities to make a brief overview of where Africa is standing in the space sector. And so we thought uh, of bringing to you uh, uh, four, uh, four visions in this respect. So the first one that will be given by Timmy Dyer from Space in Africa will essentially focus on the market. Then Magda from VDI will focus on the legal and regulatory challenges and the issues and points that need to be taken in consideration uh, when developing space activities uh, in, in Africa. Then we'll have a view of the public sector by Edwina from the Africans, uh, from the Unbalanced Space Program. And lastly, we'll have a view of the private sector by Brian from Intelsat. So thank you so much to all the speakers for accepting the invitation. And thank you to all the attendees. I'm going to give the floor to Temi Dayo to start his presentation. Thank you so much. Temi Dayo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, my name is Temi Dayo. Uh, I'm from Space in Africa. Just give me one second. Yes, um, so Space in Africa is a media analytics and consulting company uh, focusing on the African space and satellite industry. We have a headquarter in Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, um, with business operations um, across the entire African continent. And today I'll just be giving us an overview of the African space and satellite market. Uh, as we all know, Africa is a really large continent with um, about 54 countries. And some of these countries actually have some sort of space program. It's different from, you know, from each country, but um, about 19 countries actually have some sort of regulated space program. And if you look to your right, you will see the ministries that uh, each of these space programs have been run under. Um, so a lot of these space programs are actually under the Ministry of Science and Technology, um, while some are under Ministry of Communication, and some countries are fund the use of space technology for defense purposes. So they're on the space program under the Ministry of Defense, uh, while there's a particular country um, where the space activity is under the precedence. So in, in terms of policy, it, it differs from one country to another. Some countries have developed national space policies, some have developed national space strategy. Um, some have not done that, uh, while some have some sort of um, communication policy. And in some countries, you can find um, policies like geospatial policies that actually guide and direct some space activities. Majorly, African countries uh, use space technologies for socioeconomic development. So the entire space program is targeted towards space for good. 
uh, be it act observation or communication. It's all about um, improving the lives of African. Uh, that's why we have very little space exploration activities in the African space industry. Um, last year, Space in Africa released the, um, the African Space Industry Annual Report, uh, which details space activities in the region from 1998 till 2019. So today I'll be providing our with some data from this report. Uh, starting with the numbers of satellites that have been launched so far. So this shows the distribution of um, satellites that have been launched in Africa. Up to date, about 11 countries have put at least a satellite in space, uh, with the leading countries being the likes of Egypt, South Africa, Nigeria, and Algeria. Um, and you can see the distribution of these satellites uh, by the year. So last year was the year where we experienced the highest number of satellites launched uh, with eight satellites so far. Uh, generally, the number of satellites being launched by African countries uh, is increasing. In the past couple of years, we've had more satellites launched than you know, in the past 10, 15 years. And talking about the development of these satellites, a lot of these satellites were actually being built by foreign contractors with 70% of the satellites built by foreign companies, uh, predominantly in Europe. Uh, if you look to your right, you will see the list of the prime contractors for some of the satellites, with Airbus Defense and Space being the largest um, contractor of satellites from the African region, followed by Thales and Daniel. This shows that there is a very huge market for foreign companies, foreign satellite companies that are looking at business opportunities in the African region. Um, in the past couple of years, there have been improvements in capacity development in Africa um, in terms of satellite development. And uh, some of these satellites were actually built by African engineers, uh, some in Africa and some outside of Africa uh, using foreign facilities. And uh, the country with the, uh, that has manufactured the highest number of satellites for the African market is France, uh, followed by UK, China, and Russia, uh, with countries like Ukraine, Germany, US, and Japan having very little share of the market. And in, in Africa, there is, um, there is a huge drive towards universities developing capacity in terms of satellite technology development. Uh, so some of these satellites that were launched the past couple of years were actually built by um, some of these universities in Africa. And talking about launch uh, services, uh, obviously there is currently no working launch facility um, or rockets in, in Africa. Uh, and a lot of these past satellites were actually launched in the US. France and, and Russia. And um, the Haryana rocket has been like the, uh, the mostly used rocket to put most of the satellites in space. There are uh, some efforts in countries like Nigeria and South Africa towards development of rocket services um, to launch African satellites into space in the next future. Uh, oh, these are still under development phase. Contrary to popular opinion, the African countries do not exactly have funding to, uh, for space activities. This is, um, we can see the majority of the satellites that have been launched in the past couple of years were actually funded by African government uh, and commercial companies in Africa, uh, while some of the satellites were funded by universities in Africa, and some were, you know, true proceeds from insurance. Uh, there's a very tiny portion of these satellites that were actually funded by foreign governments. So African countries are actually financing the satellite technology development. The African space and satellite market is growing. Um, currently, we have about half 11 countries with a satellite in space, and it is estimated that by 2024, the number is going to rise to at least 19 countries. Uh, so a lot of these country, new countries joining the space race every year. 
Last year, for example, countries like Ethiopia, Rwanda, and Sudan actually launched their first satellite. And currently, we have uh, a couple of other countries that are working on their first satellites. Um, so the market is growing, number of satellites are growing also. This map shows the countries that would have at least a satellite in space by 2024, uh, moving from 11 countries to, to 19 countries. And it is also estimated that in the next four years, um, about 50 satellites, about 50 new satellites are going to be launched, are going to be developed and launched by African countries. Talking about the revenue segment of the industry, uh, from the reports that we published last year, uh, we found that, that the satellite television market brings the highest amount of revenue into the industry, uh, about 75.2% of the revenue. Generally, the industry uh, gains about $7.34 billion in revenue annually. Um, with satellite communications um, output bringing the biggest revenue. Uh, so looking at satellite television, uh, fixed satellite services and mobile satellite services, and also navigation services. Um, satellite technology development is contributing very little. Uh, we're beginning to see a rise in the number of companies in Africa that are actually developing satellite components. Uh, we also have earth observation um, components that are bringing some revenue into the market and remote sensing companies. Moving on to the commercial segments of the industry. Uh, last year also we released the New Space Africa industry reports, uh, profiling about 34 companies in Africa that are offering some sort of uh, products and services in the industry value chain. This, res this report was um, for companies that are focusing on upstream services. Uh, we have, we currently have over 200 companies that are focusing on downstream services in Africa, um, you know, remote sensing and GIS companies that are using satellite data for application in different industries. But uh, let me provide, an, let me give us an overview of these commercial space companies in Africa. Um, majority of them are located in South Africa. There are a lot of factors um, that actually affect the demography of these companies, uh, you know, especially in terms of policy. Uh, some countries are still having issues with uh, policies that actually attract a lot of commercial companies. Uh, in some countries, it's, it's only the government that can run space programs. So it's difficult to um, establish commercial companies that can uh, offer products and services in the industry value chain. A lot of the companies are uh, offering services and satellites, uh, technology development, um, and ground station, while Cape Town has been like the hotspots for these companies in Africa. Talking about the formation of this company, uh, majority of them are private companies that are, you know, established by individuals. We have very few companies that are funded by the government, um, while some of them are university spent. The universities in Africa are playing an important role in, um, in the industry um, in terms of research and development, and we're beginning to see spin-offs of some companies from these universities. Um, and majority of these companies are, have been depending on equity investment uh, to fund their activities. Uh, this is a bit challenging because generally the tech ecosystem in Africa is growing at a very fast rate, um, you know, attracting billions of dollars of investment every year. Um, but unfortunately, it's not the same for, you know, the commercial space segment. Um, and one of the reasons for this is because VCs and angel investors uh, that are putting money into the uh, tech ecosystem in Africa they're not very familiar with the space industry. So it's very difficult for them to, um, to invest money in the space industry. So a lot of these companies um, are actually raising funds from, uh, from VCs and angel investors in Europe and in America. Uh, and some of them have been depending on bootstrapping um, in order to scale up. 
most of the companies are also uh, offering products and services to the global market. Uh, they're not just selling to, to, to African um, customers. Uh, for a lot of them, the goal is to sell to the global market. Um, although there are some challenges uh, in, in the implementation of this. And most of the companies are, uh, are currently in the growth and established state. Um, for a lot of the commercial space companies in Africa, the exit strategy is simple. Uh, either they get acquired by a uh, by bigger company or they file for IPO. Uh, we have some of them that are currently in the established uh, business stage uh, that are looking at filing for IPO in the next couple of years. Uh, this, is, this is the goal for most of the companies. And in the past uh, few years, we've seen few companies actually exit the market, which is a very good thing for the industry. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we have uh, Magda. If you can uh, unshare the screen, Timidayo, and also we have Magda now. Thank you, Magda. You can actually show your video if you like. It's up to you. Can you uh, make sure that you are close to the microphone? A few people were co um, um, commenting that maybe the microphone is not uh, very close to you. Thank you. We can't hear you yet, Magna. Okay, now, uh, hello everyone. Yep. Good afternoon, good morning. It depends on the region where you are. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with in this session and to share a bit of our experience uh, in, in, in working in African countries. So basically this presentation will address the legal and regulatory uh, challenges in, in space, uh, in spe sector in Africa, and it's based in our experience. As Elena mentioned, as mentioned uh, uh, VDI, VDI is uh, an international law firm. Uh, uh, we have offices in certain jurisdictions, ba basically in Portuguese, uh, speaking countries in Africa. Our main offices is in Lisbon. I'm based in, in Lisbon as well as Elena, but actually we have colleagues uh, from African countries who are also attending this session, working with us in space, notably in, in Mozambique, Angola, and also Cape Verde. Uh, we have over 300 and, uh, lawyers, and um, we have a, a dedicated uh, practice to aerospace and, uh, and also a dedicated pra practice to, to ICT, uh, in which we have been working for more than 25 years, uh, not only in Europe, but also in, in Africa. Uh, in terms of our experience in, in space, I would give you and also ICT a very brief overview. So we work with the public sector, so governments, regulators, and, and also with the private sector. Uh, in the ICT sectors, we advise government in, in regulation and laws, as well as in, in space policy in, in the space domain. And uh, more related with space, we are also working in a project, uh, we have worked in a project with the European Space Agents in SATCOM cybersecurity. We have draft space laws, we have been involved in ports, space port projects, uh, advise on the setup of the institutional framework uh, for, 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 for a country and also work in SISST. And in the private sector, we, this is the type of, of assistance we do normally to, to clients in the space sector. And, and also, of course, in the ICT sector, we do other things, but this is just a general overview. Uh, we are also much involved in capacity building. Uh, uh, VDI has an academy, uh, and this academy was initially set up to, to train our lawyers that soon was put in service to, to clients. It's an independent entity and has partnerships with, with other uh, universities, not only uh, we, in, in the law field, but also in other fields. Uh, and, and notably in space, we have partnerships with International Space University, Leiden University, SESL and others. We are also members of, of, um, of YAF. 
and I will start my presentation. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, this, in this presentation, we'll try to share with you uh, uh, the, 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 the experience that we have working in ICT and in space sector. You, you will soon understand why we chose to, 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 to provide you the overview both of the ICT and also uh, the, the, the space sector. And we will consider uh, the, the, the space and ICT in particular, and also uh, general aspects that you have to take in consideration when you are investing and doing business in Africa. Uh, while we talk about Africa, and Timid, I already mentioned this as a continent, but of course we need to bear in mind that it's 54 countries, uh, uh, very different, uh, huge, uh, very different language, 1.2 billion people. So there are clearly difference. Uh, but of course, for ease of reference, we'll talk about uh, Africa as a continent and not to specific um, countries. Um, so, um, Digitalization was uh, an ongoing proce process all over the world uh, um, and also in, in a shy way in some African countries. Uh, uh, and COVID uh, accelerated the trend all over the world. Uh, and this, of course, has become a very important issue, issue in not only uh, in Europe and other continents, but in Africa, it's really a, a silver bullet to achieve the SGD goals. Uh, digitalization plays, in fact, a very important role in Africa. Uh, and there are uh, uh, several trends that accelerate a bit this, this need of digitalization. Uh, we have, uh, after COVID, we were all online working for home, uh, the, uh, doing everything from home and using our digital tools. And actually the society, uh, and after COVID, we will agree that the society needs to resort to more intelligent and, and contactless tools. And therefore this will accelerate Accelerate the digitalization. Also, the climate change uh, has played an important an important role in doubling down the effort of, of tac tackling the climate change. Uh, uh, the, the issues on demography has uh, intensified also due to the pandemic, uh, notably related to the concerns with 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 health and and the control of the pandemic. Uh, there is also a trend of deglobalization, and but still with independence. Countries realize that they need to have uh, at least their basic structures, their critical sectors need to work in, in, in an independent way. Uh, normally when, when borders are closed and, and so countries did understand that. And there is of course a growing importance of everything that has a, so the education, the health, the commerce, and this is true all over the world, but it, in Africa is actually uh, uh, extremely important. And, and the space sector, of course, and this is really important, is an enabler uh, for this purpose. The space sector cannot be seen as a, as a, a, a final sector itself. As Timida was mentioning, basically, space is used in Africa to, to, to improve the conditions of life and, and the economy and so on. And this is really important in Africa. And, and, and uh, it's a very critical point when getting into African market to raise to, to raise awareness about space technology and the advantages, you need to point out that space can actually contribute to uh, extremely practical issues in several sectors of activity and, and notably on the basics of the digitalization, which is the telecom sector. As you know, Africa has a extensive, several African countries have extensive territories and therefore in order to assure coverage, uh, mobile coverage, uh, they need to to, to set up and resort to satellite communications to, to be able to do that. And if, if you don't have the proper telecom system in place, you cannot uh, you cannot digitalize the economy, the country, and, and take advantage of all the digital um, uh, tools that can be available to citizens and to the country. So when an entity wants to develop space activities in Africa, first of all, you, this entity needs to analyze the policy environment. This is extremely important. Um, 
look to the space policies. Elena has also mentioned that uh, uh, the, the African Union has approved a space policy, but besides space, and you have, there are countries in Africa, and Timidai also pointed out, there are countries in Africa that have already space policies, but you should not stay only uh, in the space policy. You, you need to analyze all other policies like the telecoms, the data, the digital economy policies, because these policies can really uh, show opportunities for space technology uh, and so it's extremely important. I would also point out that the African Union has not only approved a space policy, but, but also a digital strategy, which has also several opportunities that can be uh, uh, achieved, that can be uh, uh, through space and through space technology. Um, this is a challenge that we face uh, uh, when we, we are working in countries, when we are uh, helping a country that drafting uh, space policy or, or space strategies. We always look all uh, other strategies in the country. So, so, so to make sure that space is actually used as, as a, an enabler and a tool to achieve a, a, those other policies. And, uh, and, and, and our experience also uh, reveals that in, in most situations, not only in Africa, but also in Europe and in, in, in several countries, uh, 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 the, the government is working in silos. So when we start developing and, and set up workshops with different members of the government, we understand that all of them are doing things in the field of space, but they are not articulating things. So it's extremely important uh, when you do a, a policy to, to analyze all the, 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 the strategies uh, and all the goals of the countries, not only in the space, but also in the other fields. Uh, another important aspect is look at partnerships. And I would focus uh, basically here the, the partnership between Africa and European Union. As you know, uh, the, there is the Cotonou Agreement that was signed uh, in 2000 and, and it's now under revision, but you need to, to, to analyze also the, the partnerships. Um, Another important uh, issue that, that you, you should take in consideration is space, is this institutional environment. It's important to understand the main actors in the country, uh, either from, from the country or from abroad. Uh, uh, so the, the country, and Timirai also mentioned in the beginning that uh, typically, and this corresponds to our experience, uh, these issues, these space related issues are sometimes within the Minister of Science and Technology uh, and, and but mostly with the Minister of Communication, which highlights the fact that uh, uh, the, the link between communication and the satellite industry is, of course, very important. Uh, but you need to understand if there is a space authority, a space agent who is the entity uh, competent to assign orbital positions, and also which type of entities uh, able to, to provide license if you want to deliver signal in the country. So uh, there are a lot of issues that you need to understand about institutional uh, um, the environment and framework. Also, if there are innovation uh, hubs, clusters, and so on. Uh, another point that I would like here to outline is the, the need and the focus on capacity building and technology transfer. Timidai also mentioned this. This is a, a really a, an important concern in Africa, as well as in other emerging countries that, that are investing now in space. Countries want to be independent, so you need, you need to make sure that you, you address the problem project in a very co cooperative way, uh, uh, a smart collaboration where, where the country also gains training uh, and capacity building. PDI has conducted several capacity building, uh, not only for, for instance, we did that for telecom regulator, wanted to know about uh, the location of spectrum, what is important to consider not only for the telecom, spectrum, uh, telecom sector, but also for the space sector. And we did a, a workshop and a very intensive workshop to the regulator in, in one country and also several workshops with other countries, notably in the context of, of, of the preparation of the space strategies and, and policies. And this is also very important because we understand that uh, we are um, that we are, uh, we need to have people in, in that are capable of pursuing the space policies that countries approve. Um, 
I'm moving very quickly to the legal and regulatory uh, environment. Uh, so you need to understand if the country has space law and general, in general, our experience, the countries don't have space law, but you need also to identify when we are conducting a project if, if, if the country is a member to the UN space treaties, because we face situations where a country, a government has committed to obligation and then we, under contracts, and then we see that those obligations relates to, uh, to, to, to UN convention and then the country hasn't signed, hasn't been made a member of that convention. So it's really important to address and to tackle also this. Um, also, it's extremely important to, to make sure that you, you, you understand the general uh, applicable laws because uh, uh, there are issues, for instance, related to liability and force majeure, which must be taken in consideration in the context of satellite contracts. For instance, uh, satellite con contracts have, uh, in general, cross waivers of liability, and there are mandatory applicable laws that forbid, uh, in certain situations, this type of, uh, of issues. Also, in the, the concept of force majeure, which gained extremely importance after the COVID, it's also important to, to, to understand if there are, what are the rules if the company uh, uh, that launches a satellite that is is evolving a project uh, is, uh, um, ceases activity, what's happened to the satellite. This was a concern, for instance, in the Portuguese law, which we draft, and we specifically addressed this issue of a company uh, going insolvent or uh, or having some economic problems what will happen to the asset that is explored together in other, with other with other companies uh, finally it's also important to understand if the country has as innovation regulatory teams this is very common right now we are working in a project of smart regulation in one country where the country wants to uh, uh, create the kind of most fo most favorable environment to, to develop new technologies and therefore uh, uh, um, not, not applying all the constraints and obligations that normally would be applicable to that project. And finally, and I'll be uh, addressing this very quickly because Timmy Dayu already mentioned most of what he said here, is that you need to, to understand the market environment uh, with, with everything that Timmy Dayu already mentioned. Of course, financing is a, a, an important issue all over the world and in Africa as well. And as Timida, you mentioned, uh, Af African governments are the major uh, uh, sponsors of, of projects in Africa. So that's why it's so important to understand what are the goals of the country uh, in terms of of investment and what are the priorities of the country, uh, notably in, in, the, in the development of, of, of ICT tools. Uh, there are, of course, other potential sources of funding. So the African Central Bank, the African Investment Bank, we have been working in Africa in projects notably related with infrastructures in, for instance, submarine cables, uh, where these entities are involved. And I, I, I would expect to see more investment also in, in space related matters in, in this context. Um, One more minute. This is my, my last slide. <laughs> so finally, there are issues that you need to take in consideration when you are investing in, 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 in Africa and as well as in other countries. This is not specific from Africa. So investment laws and regulation, uh, foreign exchange rules, uh, uh, but I would outline also local content rules, which are extremely important in several African countries. This is uh, linked with the logic of every uh, transfer of knowledge, capacity, to the country in order for the country to be to be recognized. Another important issue when you are investing in, in and this is the final mention that I will do, uh, the, is to understand if the country as, as, as a member has protection, as international protection for investment. For instance, if the country is member of UN conventions on inter, and a member of International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. So that to, to, to make sure that if it, something goes wrong, you can have have a proper instrument to, to address uh, the investment that was made. And thank you very much. I'm available for any questions. Okay, so we're going to move on to Edwina. Uh, Edwina, if you can uh, show your screen, I'm going to uh, do the presentation for you. And Magda, if you can switch off your uh, video, please. Thank you. 
Uh, so Edwina, just a second, let me find your presentation. Just a second, I need to find, I had it open before. There it is, found it. Just a second. Share screen. Okay. Do you see my screen, Edwina? Uh, no, I can't see. Though any other of the panelists see my screen? Elena, uh, Magda, can you see my screen? No. Mm. All right, just a second. Something is going on here. If you want to start as I find the presentation, I don't know what's happening here. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Edwina Tsudoro. Um, I work in GGPN, which uh, GGPN is the Angolan National Space Management Project, uh, Office. So in my presentation today, I will um, present the GGPN, um, of uh, GGPN, and I will also give an uh, overview of the Angolan National Space Strat Strategy and some of the Angolan initiatives in the space sector. Uh, Tony, can you move to the other? Okay, thank you. So uh, GGPN, as I said before, is the Angolan National Space Management Office. So here uh, is a um, we have some of the competences of GGPN. In Angola, uh, GGPN is the institution with competence to manage and monitor the Angolan National Space Program. So, um, as I said, here are some of the competences of uh, GGPN as uh, operationalize and administer the National Space Program portfolio of projects, uh, managing human resources, ensuring training and specialization, uh, establish cooperation protocols with technical and scientific institutions in the field of space. Uh, in the next slide, um, taking into account the Yes, uh, the investment of Angola and with a view uh, to the social economic development through the resources of space in order to bring some benefits in several areas, since, for example, uh, the improvement or of general conditions with the use of uh, telecommunication satellites. So, uh, the Angola, Angola has in the, um, the, the national space strategy uh, the general guidelines regarding to space activities activity in Angola. Also aiming to fulfill the national space uh, space program and its goals, namely uh, the development of technological skills, uh, the development of scientific competences of Angolan human resources. Uh, the induction uh, of the development of space industry, uh, the development of international cooperation in the peaceful use of space resources. Uh, in the next slide, uh, Tony, can you please uh, put the, the next slide? No, uh, the other one? Okay. So here is an image of what the space industry is in general. So within uh, with what has been the path of Angola in terms of space initiatives and the fulfillment of the national space program, Angola has launched a, tele a telecommunication satellite, which is Anglosat-1 in 2007. Uh, which were due to technical reasons, it became inoperable. Uh, but uh, additionally, 
uh, within the objectives of the national of the uh, of Angola in uh, and the national space program, uh, Angola built a uh, ground segment, uh, which is the satellite mission control center, and pr promoted the training, the training and specializing uh, staff in uh, satellite operation. Also, uh, Angola was able to uh, promote the expansion of service distribution network at national level. And um, additionally, I would like to say that in GGPN, we have been promoting also the training uh, of staff uh, in developing a, a satellite application. For example, such as in remote sensing, agriculture, and urban planning. Uh, in the next slide, um, looking to what is the Africa space industry uh, and the growth of the African space market, uh, reaching the value of seven billion dollars annually, and with the projection of growth of forty percent in the next five years. We can see that uh, that we can see a growth in the interest of African countries in terms of space exploration, space activities, and its space programs. So, Angola uh, is one of the countries that uh, um, launched a satellite. Um, like other countries, uh, the use of uh, space technologies um, contributes to contributes to solving some of the challenges and the needs that we have. So, for example, in Angola, uh, we were able to, within the compensations related to Anglosat 1, we were able to, uh, for example, promote the availability of telephone services in rural areas, uh, we were able to promote telemedicine programs in some provinces of Angola. Also, uh, in a regional level, in order to uh, develop um, in space technology, uh, Angola is a leader in the SATEC satellite sharing initiative, in which each country will share its resources in terms of space technology, industry, in terms of infrastructure and human resources. Uh, in the next slide, please. Also, uh, it's important to mention the next one. Uh, it's also important to mention that in the, the Angolan uh, National Space Strategy, uh, the next slide, please, Tony. Uh, the Angola National Space Strategy is based in five, fund five fundamental pillars, uh, which are uh, pillar one, uh, the development of space infrastructures. Uh, number two, pillar two, training and space education. Uh, pillar three, growth of space industry. Uh, pillar four, international affirmation. Pillar five, organizational structures. So regarding to what has already been achieved, in Angola, you can see this, uh, Tony, the next slide, uh, and within what are the structuring projects, we were able to, related to Pillar 1, Angola has, a, has launched a telecommunication satellite, which is Anglosat 1, as I said before, and now we, we are working, Angola is working to, uh, in the construction of Anglosat 2, which is also a telecommunication satellite. Uh, related to pillar two, which is training and space education, uh, in terms of the human resources training project, GGPN has 42 trained and specialized staffs in areas of engineering and space technology, analysis of satellite systems, ballistics, and navigation, just to give some examples. Uh, so I end here my presentation. And thank you. Thank you so much, Edwina. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. If you can switch off your video, we can get Brian on board.
Thank you, Brian. Okay, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, just get this up. There we go. <clears throat> so I guess I share, I get a, an opportunity to share some of the exciting things that we are doing using satellite services, uh, in particularly across the region. Um, so who Intelsat is, I represent Intelsat in Africa. Uh, we are one of the largest operators in terms of revenue capacity and geographical reach. Um, we've been in operation since 1965 um, and uh, we maintain today uh, just over 50 odd satellites of which 26 cover uh, Africa in particular. Um, we uh, own and operate uh, 52 of those satellites and six other satellites we operate for uh, other countries and other individual operators, um, as it is quite expensive to, to manage individual satellites. Um, just to show you some of uh, where satellite matters and what it's hap what's happening in the industry today. Um, satellite is a very important and we don't normally see how it touches our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when you look at, uh, satellite has a key role in the global communications ecosystem. Uh, we work in hybrid networks, working with terrestrial services. Uh, we provide cloud services. Uh, we do backhaul and trunking services for mobile operators. Uh, we offer consumer broadband services. Um, some of the biggest, um, let's say, use cases for satellite have been television and media broadcasting. Um, so when you switch on your uh, television and you've got a a setup box and you've got a satellite dish. Um, most of these uh, channels are broadcast through uh, satellite services. We do a lot of uh, retail banking services and I'll take you through some of those in, in the next few slides. Um, a lot of military and government applications and then obviously the evolution from uh, 2G services into uh, 5G services across, uh, across the globe. Some of the applications that I wanted to talk about and share with you uh, that as satellite operators and as Intelsat, we are uh, currently doing delivering media content. I will share with you some of the video neighborhoods across Africa uh, and what's relevant. What we're doing to bridge the connectivity uh, divide in hard to reach places, um, which is quite essential um, for, let's say, economic growth in some of our rural uh, areas. As you know, 50 to 60% of Africa remains rurally uh, dispersed and a large population sits outside of traditional connectivity solutions. Um, and then one of the uh, traditional enterprise services is empowering the banking sector uh, to be able to connect and expand their services uh, into areas that were traditionally hard to reach. So delivering media content and uh, how we do this across the territory. So if you look at the growth from satellite TV services, currently serving uh, more than 60% or 63% of African homes. Uh, if you look at the forecasts, we're looking at 46,000 plus channels to be broadcast across the region, uh, sub-Saharan Africa by 2026. Uh, this is significant growth um, for services that are traditionally not uh, able to reach uh, specific homes, particularly in rural locations. Uh, from an Intelsat point of view, uh, we have 900, uh, just over 900 channels uh, distributed across the region. Uh, and these are through some of our traditional players like Multi-Choice, uh, UBC, ZNBC, uh, and Centec, which is a local uh, a broadcaster, uh, state broadcaster in Southern Africa. Um, to show you more in terms of what we do, one of the video neighborhoods in, in uh, Intelsat is uh, IS-20. Um, and when I talk about IS-20, uh, the number of satellites, we know, normally name our satellites uh, based on a number in terms of what we launch. Um, this uh, satellite is specific to direct-to-home uh, video neighborhood across sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we currently broadcast over 560 channels on this satellite. Um, it's really focused uh, KU beams of the sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it has 40 million well, we cover 40 million TV households um, across sub-Saharan Africa. And if you look at from East Africa coming down into Southern Africa, 
um, fairly significant uh, subscriber base from Ethiopia all the way down to uh, South Africa. Some of the channels that you would be familiar with is uh, the Discovery Channel, MTV, Sky News, BBC, VH1, um, and some of the genres, uh, obviously entertainment, something that we've missed lately is sports. Um, so a lot of uh, football or soccer um, and international sporting events uh, are broadcast on uh, over these satellites. So <clears throat> in everyday's life, I think this is where we start. If you're uh, able to switch on a TV and be able to watch some of these broadcasts, uh, there's a very good chance that this will be over one of Intelsat satellites. Uh, one of the more important parts that we play a role in is obviously bridging and connecting the digital, uh, or bridging the digital divide and looking at connecting to remote areas. Um, when you look at some of these areas, it's very difficult to provide terrestrial services to those areas. Um, so satellite is typically the only practical way uh, to bridge that divide and to provide connectivity into those areas. Um, and here we're just quoting uh, a study from Frost and Sullivan where they said several technology options do exist for backhaul of radio access networks. And radio access networks are the base stations that you see uh, from the MNOs uh, across the regions. Uh, these would be MTN, Orange, Vodacom, et cetera, um, Safaricom. Uh, and uh, also they say the only technology that's really suitable from either a cost practicality or uh, ease of deployment uh, in some of these wireless access networks is uh, satellite communications. So one of the examples that I would like to share with you is, is uh, uh, connecting uh, some of Uganda's unconnected. Um, Intelsat and MTN were working together uh, to provide two rural sites. Uh, these are just examples of some of the sites that we provided. Uh, so one of them was the Bufundi site, um, and then Toroko site uh, where we provided uh, a low cost uh, infrastructure, part of a RAN solution uh, to provide connectivity into those rural communities. But the Bufundi cell site currently covers uh, two primary schools, uh, so provides internet connectivity to them. And the Toroko cell site offers coverage to a healthcare center and to a primary school. And this was with, uh, in collaboration with MTN. Um, and we've been doing this across the region. When we look at what we've been doing with uh, a company called African Mobile Networks, uh, Intelsat invested into a company called AMN, and this was really to accelerate uh, mobile connectivity across the region, uh, mainly across Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, to leverage our ubiquitous coverage uh, of the global network that we have. Obviously, 26 satellites covering Africa gives us uh, significant capacity to provide uh, this connectivity across the region. Um, so this is really uh, inspiring and, and it's, it changes the game in terms of connecting some of these rural connectivity uh, or what were previously challenging connectivity areas where uh, traditional terrestrial services couldn't reach. So some of the pictures here that I've shared with you is solar powered, as you can see, the VSAT dish. Um, this is uh, one of the sites in Liberia. Uh, we've got a reference site in, in Zambia. There's large scale deployment across a lot of villages in Nigeria. Um, and this is obviously connecting them with voice and data. Um, we've also done across West Africa in Ghana, where we worked with some of the regulators um, to provide some connectivity uh, into some of these rural villages and, and uh, working with the United Nations uh, to make sure that some of their camps are also connected. In order to do this, it has to be sustainable, it has to be community owned, and it has to drive economic development within those communities. Um, and then in South Africa as well, uh, working with the government here and uh, Centec, uh, we worked on the internet from Zanzi project. Uh, this was really to improve the adoption of services, uh, looking at cost effective solutions into rural areas. Uh, into small enterprise uh, businesses. As you can see, there's a VSAT on top of a, uh, let's say a medical facility. Um, we want to create and empower the youth, uh, obviously driving ICT and SMEs um, and create employment opportunities. Again, it's important that uh, when you do these deployments, um, there's economic activity added to those areas where you're 
and providing those services. So Intelsat for a large portion of its uh, privatization has been investing in uh, infrastructure on the ground to support the economic development of these communities uh, and enable increased, um, let's say, participation in uh, digital technologies uh, across the region. And the last one that I wanted to share with you again is uh, where we're empowering uh, and working with banks across the region uh, that rely on VSAT networks for primary services. And when they have primary services to use satellite as a backup service for when those primary services go down. Um, some of you will re remember a couple of months back that uh, the wax cable went down and uh, we all had slow internet or no internet. Um, and this is where satellite kicked in to provide backup services as well uh, as primary services. So this picture that I wanted to show is really showing you how some of these uh, uh, automatic teller machines or the ATMs from some of the banks are connected. Uh, you can see the dish on the top. Um, and this provides low implementation and low operational costs. It's very flexible solutions uh, with the bandwidth bringing the total cost of ownership much lower than a terrestrial link, either microwave or fiber. Um, and it provides high availability to the banks, which is what they need. Uh, there's flexibility in terms of the bandwidth. And as I said, it's quick and it's easy to deploy. Um, so this sort of infrastructure has substantially increased um, the bank's geographical ranges and allowing them to reach uh, rural communities. There's different parts of this that you add to as well as we look at mobile money um, and providing connectivity uh, to mobile access um, so that they can transact in these rural locations. The last slide that I really want to share is to give you an overview of where we are working with the banking sector. And these are really some of the exciting solutions. We work with EcoBank, which is a Pan-African bank. Um, it's one of the largest in Africa. And this is using a C-band spot beam on Intelsat's IS-35 uh, to strengthen its corporate banking services. Um, and address increasing transaction volumes for its customers. Uh, this has to be a very reliable, highly available service. Uh, also working with um, local partners like a company called QCon, who provide First National Bank, uh, which is one of the major banks in South Africa, uh, to provide satellite services uh, for their branches to do backup services and primary services to their ATMs. Um, so QCon is a uh, a trusted partner for FNB sector and are able to provide these services uh, to the banking sector across uh, this region. Also working across uh, West Africa again with uh, BCR, uh, using Intelsat's capacity, uh, BCR is part of the eight member country states of West Africa uh, over the uh, West African Monetary Union and uh, we provide CVAN services uh, to connect their banking sector as well. Um, and then last but not least, really just touching up on APSA Standard Bank and NetBank, uh, working with uh, Telcom, which is a, a local telecommunications company, a state-owned te telecommunications company originally, uh, and its largest shareholder is the state in, in South Africa. Uh, they were primarily a fixed line provider and uh, recently expanded into the mobile network side of it. Um, and Telcom is a large satellite provider of these services uh, into the banking sector. So there are very exciting projects uh, happening in the satellite sector. Uh, we support uh, regulators and governments across uh, the region uh, when it comes to launching their own satellites, providing these services, uh, provide training, uh, infrastructure uh, to support the growth of satellites so that we can bridge uh, the digital divide. Um, and this is really a summary um, of where Intelsat has been. And as we look forward to the future, we're looking at uh, even further innovation in terms of IoT, uh, into farming communities, uh, e-health services, et cetera. Um, so it's an exciting time, I think, for the African market as far as uh, satellite services are concerned. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll hand back to Tony. Hey, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to get back Elena and everybody else on, on the screen. Elena is going to now lead the uh, discussion, 10, 15 minutes discussion between the, with the panelists, and then I will take the Q&A, the questions from the attendees, uh, the last 10 minutes of the uh, panel.
All yours, Elena. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, thank you so much for all the presentations. They were very interesting and uh, very much showed how, the, how our African countries are very much active in the space sector. Uh, one thing that uh, I think uh, we noticed in common is the importance not only of uh, public-led space programs, but also of the private sector and how governments can uh, promote uh, the private sector. So I would like to ask each of you, um, how do you think that African states can promote uh, innovation and uh, startups and, and, and the space uh, sector in general uh, in Africa and in African countries? So I probably will start with Temidayo. Temidayo. Thank you for the question. Um, I think there are already a lot of efforts by different countries to uh, promote the commercial segment of the obvious space industry. Um, for example, there is um, there is a news that came out today about South Africa. Temidayo, uh, we can't hear you very well. Can you have uh, somehow close to the speaker? Sorry about that. Okay, is it better now? Yes, yeah, much better, thank you. Okay, so uh, I was given an example of uh, South Africa. They recently set aside some, um, some funding to develop uh, a space hub, you know. So this is, this is an example of an effort to get towards, uh, you know, supporting commercial space companies in the country. Um, and, you know, we're also seeing the same thing in other countries. Uh, an example is Nigeria is also looking at creating that kind of ecosystem. Uh, so it's important for government institutions to support the commercial companies, uh, either through providing funding or providing con uh, giving them contracts uh, in order to scale up uh, or providing the right kind of atmosphere for them to uh, develop their products and services. Thank you so much. So, uh, so uh, I'll go through to, to Edwina with, with the same question. So just getting into what Timmy Dayo was saying, uh, how is Angola approaching the, the promotion of innovation in the private sector in space? Um, in the private sector, I believe that uh, here uh, in GGP and what we have been doing, uh, not only in the private sector, but uh, we are I've been working with schools and young uh, people, uh, for example, on learning how to build small satellites and concepts. So this way we can promote space technology and also promote space education. Yes, that's a very important point actually. So the, the, the whole issue of capacity building to ensure that countries become autonomous and independent in their space efforts. I would like to to get also the, this point to, to Brian, the, that represents here the private sector. Uh, how do you see these, these two issues, you know, the promotion of innovation, the, 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 the connection with capacity building, how, what are the main, the main points that you think are important for, for the countries that you are present uh, to, to achieve these objectives? Yeah, definitely. I think that the, you know, innovation is uh, significant on the satellite side. If you look at where we have a parabola antenna now, uh, moving to flat panel antennas that have uh, self-alignment uh, to the satellite. Uh, and this is becoming uh, probably one of the most pervasive technologies uh, to come into the satellite uh, industry. I think it comes down to training. Um, and if we look at across the region, we've seen a significant, uh, if I could call it brain drain of uh, satellite skills. So it really comes back down to uh, providing those skills on the ground, investing in uh, economic uh, systems that uh, grow communities as far as this technology is concerned, um, as well as looking at from a government perspective, how we enable these technologies uh, through the relaxation of license fees uh, for small uh, to medium enterprises and smaller businesses to start up uh, in these industries. I think it's, it, it becomes pretty expensive if we have difficult licensing uh, regimes. Um, so these are some of the areas I think the government and private sector could contribute to uh, to enable satellite to grow and drive economic sustainability uh, for a large portion of the communities that uh, private and government sectors serve uh, across Africa. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so you actually mentioned a point that's very interesting and connects with uh, also an issue that was addressed during the presentation. So the issue of uh, licenses and the startups and, and, you know, sometimes the, the, the fact that uh, laws and regulations and the legal framework is very much the same and doesn't take into attention the, 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 the different features of different companies and entities. So with this in mind, I, I'll go to, to Magda to, to give us a, 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 legal, a legal point of view. How, how do you think that we can ensure that the legal framework can still protect the, the, the goals of, you know, that result from the UN space treaties and the concerns that, that arise from there and at the same time take into consideration, you know, the, uh, you know, the differences between companies that, and, and, and the fact that sometimes the requirements can be very burdensome for small companies, the, the issue that Brian was, was pointing out. You're, you're on mute, Magda. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, I, I would divide this into aspects. So the first aspect would be within uh, when preparing the space laws. I think that uh, government has to bear that in mind. And uh, this is a concern and not establishing very uh, extremely formal requirements to, applicable to space activities and to allow for some innovation within uh, the space sector. And this is extremely important in the context where, when governments are preparing licensing regimes and access regimes to, to space activities, but also uh, um, uh, investing in, in smart regulation that is a very trendy co concept. Uh, approving laws that are uh, that creates free technological areas, uh, uh, free technological um, regimes, so that to allow companies to test in a safe environment, but at the same time not limiting innovation. So, uh, and we are working currently with with some governments, and we know actually that some governments in in Africa want also to have this kind of regulatory sandboxes. They want to approve regulatory sandboxes, and this is possible. Possible, not, not only to a certain technology, so uh, uh, several European countries have approved a regulatory sandbox in the context of fintech, but uh, for instance in Portugal, and we are working on that in Portugal, we are working on a project that wants to implement a, a regulatory sandbox across, across sectors, so this is possible, and space can be one of those sectors, and we know that in African countries, there are, they are countries that are already trying to, to invest in this type of new smart regulation that enables company to test their systems and not be bound by strict and limited uh, rules and regulations. Of course, this has to be controlled, uh, but, but it's, it's also an important option in terms of promoting innovation. Okay, thank you so much. Actually, you also mentioned uh, an interesting point, the issue of uh, the promotion of innovation across sectors. It was one of the points that was also highlighted in several presentations was the connection of uh, you know, the space technology and products and services with ICT in general. So, and I will go again uh, to Timmy Dayu. Um, from your knowledge of the, the African market, um, how do you think that this point that Magda was making, not only with relation to legal frameworks, but, uh, you know, hubs and networks uh, that uh, are not necessarily focused on space, that can be focused on ICT, on software, uh, etc., and can be brought together to further promote uh, the, the space sector and, and the, the private sector in African countries? Yes, uh, it's important for us to bring together a lot of associated uh, industries, you know, like communication, distribution industry, and all of that. To bring them and assist them with the space industry. Uh, in some countries, they try to differentiate this. Uh, so there's like policy of communication, there's policy of the space, uh, you know, but there's a way they, they're able to bring this together. Uh, so some countries are trying to like um, establish different kind of agencies to focus on, um, you know, just related issues. And, and I think it's a work in for some. Um, if you look at countries like Egypt, uh, you know, like Nigeria, they've got like, uh, you know, work they're doing around communication that connects with like other industry. Uh, and then they are able to like separate that from like the space industry, uh, you know, that is all about using data and all of that. Uh, so I think this is a, 
method that you know other countries can, can actually follow. Uh, in, interestingly, if you look at um, the revenue stream in the industry, communication is like the key revenue source. Uh, so it's important for us to not just develop policy for space, uh, but you know make sure that policy for communication is actually the one that allows for growth and development. Exactly. That point that you mentioned about alignment, so guaranteeing that different sectors are closer together and, and they have, you know, an aligned view. So to ensure that you know, all agencies and all sectors in a country realize that space is actually an instrument to achieve certain goals. It's not necessarily an end in itself. So with that in mind, I would go back to Edwina and, and, ask, and ask Edwina if uh, uh, in, in Angola, um, how is the approach being made uh, you know, between the, the space program uh, and, uh, you know, the other sectors, not necessarily only, only ICT. So I can imagine, for example, agriculture and I can imagine, you know, public construction and uh, oil and gas. So how is that connection is being made to guarantee that space instruments and the products and services are being actually, you know, taken advantage of in all of, of these different sectors of the economy? Um, yes, as I said before, um, it's important to us to realize that what are the benefits that we can uh, get from space technologies and this is one of our uh, concerns and this one is um, we are trying to as i said in the presentation we are working to uh, in the training of our staff so we can um, start developing some uh, this, uh, this satellite application so we can um, be able to um, uh, create the application in some of the, the needs that we have in agriculture, for example, um, urban planning. These are some of the object, objectives goals that we also have here in Angola. Yes, I'm, I, I, I know that that's also one of the pillars and one of the goals of the Angolan space policy, exactly the, the, the whole capacity building, not only in the, in, in, you know, the, the public sector, but also in civil society in general to be able to use, you know, space technology and services and products. Also, and, um, yeah. Yes, yes, go ahead. Yes, I was saying that uh, for us it's important to also um, have the knowledge not only in our staff, but also in the public in general. So the uh, space education is also important for us. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I, I would go back again to Magda on the issue of space education. Um, as as, as uh, you know, um, Edwin was mentioning and then Brian was also mentioning before, uh, the, the issue of, of space education in using applications and the products and services and also in upstream, you know, in the whole building satellites and, and technology for space uh, is also is very relevant. From a legal point of view and the regulatory point of view, how do you think, uh, how do you see the importance of, you know, space law and teaching space law? Do you think it has any impact on how countries and the space sector, the private space sector, addresses uh, and, and uh, space, do you think it has an impact on the development of the sector? And if yes, how do you think this should be approached? Yeah, definitely. But, but before uh, going to that question, I just want to mention something to complement what Brian and Edwin and also Temedai was saying in relation to the connection with the telecom sector and the space sector. Actually, as far as I remember, uh, for instance, in, 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 several, in several African uh, ICT policies, one of the goals to, to assure coverage, mobile coverage in countries, is uh, through satellite uh, communication. So uh, this is clearly a, a, a field where uh, companies that want to invest in Africa should look into so that to make sure that, that this is something that they know where they can invest. Also, I, I would like to point out that uh, contrary to what happened in Europe, where we have a, a concept of universal service in the telecoms that is defined by the European institutions, and it's basically a, a service that's identified in relation to 
what every population in Europe has to have access. In Africa, the model is more a universal service fund. So basically what African countries do in terms of telecoms is they that operators contribute to a fund where they invest and then the government or the regulator decides where those funds are applicable. And as far as I remember, no fund has been used so far to develop uh, uh, satellite communications in Africa. And, and this is clearly a trend uh, that should be considered by governments as probably in some situations, satellites as the, are the best option to, to, make, to, to assure coverage of countries. In relation to the capacity building, I think that is extremely important. We have been doing that a lot uh, in, 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 in our firm and using Vidya Academia and also teaching uh, um, uh, because I mean, when you are working in space, you need you need to understand all the environment and, and the legal and the institutional environment is extremely important. And you need, to, people need to know what are the main principles of the UN conventions to, to make sure they understand and they have the full picture of, of what is applicable in the space domain. And also uh, uh, not only the legal uh, environment, international legal environment of space, but also to understand what are the, the other fields of law and the other aspects of law that impact on space. Uh, you know that when we are working in a project, we are working and we, we have in the background the, 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 the UN treaties and the, the international law on space, but we are working also with IoT and artificial intelligence and, and other technologies that are also uh, um, regulated in, in, in some countries or where, where you need to, to take in consideration legal aspects that apply to those technologies. So teaching and capacity building in this field of law, it's extremely important, not only uh, in relation to international law, but also to, to uh, related laws with space activities. Okay, thank you. So I know, Tony, that you're already there, so we must be <laughs> quite at the end, but I would just like to, to have Brian final thoughts because Brian is the, the representative of the, the private, you know, uh, a private space sector company here. So I'd like to, to just, you know, very briefly have Brian final thoughts on on these issues that uh, that have been uh, addressed here. Look, these are <coughs> these are difficult issues, and I think that the collaboration between the private and uh, uh, government sector can overcome. I think that uh, you know, as Edwina actually quite accurately shared, uh, Angosat one was launched, and there were some technical issues. Um, but the Angolan government said this is key for us to properly bridge this digital divide. So they're on Angosat two. Um, you know, these are the right strategies uh, for a digitally inclusive society, and a lot of countries are adopting these. Um, so we need to find a way from the private sector to invest in infrastructure, to grow economics uh, with small companies. Uh, from a government point of view, we need to take away or relax some of the regulations to enable them to grow. Um, and I think that this combination will enable a greater society of satellite. I think that we all think of satellite as complicated, difficult, slow, expensive, and this is not the case today. Um, today is very different to what it was 10 or 15 years ago, where there were no alternatives. So it's an exciting time, innovation is there, costs are a lot lower, the total cost of ownership is lower. We need to spend more time educating um, and driving uh, success through implementation. And I think that this could be achieved in closer collaboration with the government sectors and private sectors. So exciting times for the satellite industry. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you to all the speakers. So, Tony. Uh, so thank you to all the speakers. Uh, uh, as a regulator myself, I, I do actually like to say that uh, you can only improve the situation. It's, it's much better today, of course, than it was uh, 10 years ago, but you can always improve the situation if the governments and the regulators work together uh, with the industry to uh, uh, let's say harmonize and also to uh, make it uh, a much better uh, environment uh, on a regulatory regime basis. Uh, if you want your market to grow, if you want to connect to the unconnected people, you have to lower your barrier to entry. That's quite important from the industry. I, I myself have uh, been working in, in the industry and also uh, with the UK regulator uh, in the past and understand very well the, the, the issues and the problems of the industry when they need to access uh, a country or a region uh, for the services and often they find barriers of entry which are quite high to to overcome 
uh, Europe uh, and the Western world, let's say, has, has, has done a lot of the past 20 years. We're, we're liberalizing the sector. Uh, it will be useful to liberalize it as well in Africa and in other, in other regions of the world because that will help you. It will help the, uh, the end users as well a lot, basically. But with that point, um, I would like to open up the Q&A from the audience. There are four questions. In the meantime, I also uh, launched a poll, which everybody can see and you can vote. Uh, on the question side, I'm going to, there are four uh, and, and growing as, as well. I'm going to go one by one. Uh, the four, first one from Jose Luis Moutinho uh, is, is asking basically to Temi Dayo. Uh, you mentioned that three of the African satellites were the result of a multilateral effort. Could you please elaborate on this? Yes, uh, so these are satellites that had, you know, involvement of a lot of African countries. Uh, an example is the satellites built along the last uh, So Rastom is an organization that has involvement of over 40 African countries. Um, so, and, and their aim is improving communication services. So uh, all of these countries came together to form Rastom and they developed some sort of satellite project that will launch a couple of years ago. Um, so this is an example of a multilateral effort uh, that had involvement with a lot of African countries. Uh, so, for example, in the future, if, if the African space agencies considering developing and launching satellite, that would be like a multilateral. Thank you, Temi Dai. And uh, next question, uh, anybody can pick it up if you like. How do we get involved in the African space sector? From Jay Dialani. So how do we get involved in the African space sector? Who's going to answer that? Maybe Timmy you know. Timmy Dayo, can you get close to the microphone, please? Close. Okay, um, how to get involved in the African space sector? I, I would say it depends on the we. Um, you know, like the person that is asking the question, are you coming from, um, you know, a foreign space agency or a foreign space company? Uh, or are you an individual? So it all depends. It's, um, I would say there are opportunities for collaboration and partnership with um, African space institutions. So this is a way to go. Um, if you're an investor, a lot of companies are looking for investment. So that's also a way to, uh, to get involved. Anybody else would like to uh, answer that? Uh, how would a company, for example, get involved in Africa? No? Okay, you need to invest, I suppose, <laughs> and invest your time uh, and find a partner, basically. That's yeah. the way it works. Uh, mm -hmm. Next question from Jose, uh, let me go to Bruno Calvagna first. Mm -hmm. uh, Magda mentioned the EU-Africa agreement. Can you specify mm -hmm. how that can be used to promote the space activity in the African continent and how you see, it, uh, see its operational setup work? Okay, sure. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to clarify that I brought this uh, uh, African-European Union agreement because, as you probably know, uh, Europe is the, the, the largest investor in Africa. Uh, the agreement is still under discussion, uh, but the agreement foresees several aspects of collaboration in different fields. Uh, if I quite remember, Earth observation is one of them, and also ICT. Uh, so uh, I, I think that after conclusion of this uh, this renovation of the agreement that 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 is undergoing right now, uh, you you can we can explore uh, of course ways to cooperate and be involved in, in this. I would like also to highlight uh, that there is also a, a European joint communication that is uh, called towards a comprehensive strategy in Africa that uh, envisages much the cooperation in Africa and, and therefore uh, in the digital transformation and. As I mentioned in my presentation, space is a key, key uh, aspect in, the, in this digital transformation in Africa because without, without connectivity and you cannot connect using a traditional, well, terrestrial mobile technology to, to connect all uh, remote areas in, in, in Africa, satellites, in my view, play a very important role in, in, this, in this field. So that's the way through. Thank you. And I'm going to pick up the next question from Atanilson Tucker. Uh, 
is the question to all the panelists. How can each individual in Africa be part or contribute to the development of the African space industry? Well, I can I can start. It depends a bit what exactly uh, um, are the skills involved in every everyone. So but basically, what what there are several groups uh, and Timidai, as Oration mentions, uh, where people can be involved with, and then. I mean, there is a need for uh, for experts and for for knowledge people in Africa in this field of space. So uh, it depends on the age or the interest of the the investment that this the, uh, everyone wants to do in space. But I mean, it's a growing uh, need. Uh, Africa needs professionals in the space field. So uh, I would say that this is a, a good way to begin with to try to obtain training. There are several courses online and not online. So uh, there are this is, I believe, the best way to, 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 to get involved in space and be part of communities, of space community. There are several. Uh, Timida, you mentioned, I also saw in the Q&A or in the chat that someone was also publishing other communities that are that exist in Africa in the field of space. So that's probably the first approach. Then it depends a bit on the goals and the skills that each person has and can, can, put, uh, can offer to the space sector in Africa, I would say. Thank you. I have a question myself. Um, maybe um, all of you can answer. It's it's regarding affordability of services of telecommunication services from satellite mm -hmm. space platforms in Africa, uh, especially for example satellite broadband and so on. I, I always get this question when I go and travel or when I or from other people. Um, how are you coping with affordability of services in Africa when people may not be able to afford them? Um, that's a very generic question, I suppose. Maybe you could you you could answer that to me, Brian, or or even uh, yeah, Edwina. I mean, if we look at uh, if we look at the cost of satellite services as they've evolved over the last years, uh, I can speak on behalf of Intelsat. that we've developed uh, what we call our Epic satellites, which really uh, drive higher efficiencies. Um, and really, what this means is, you and I, as a consumer, we buy megabits and gigabytes. Um, so we'll buy a package of uh, data uh, for our connectivity at home or for our connectivity in our business and how much of that data you can extract from one megahertz on a satellite perspective. Um, that's really what the efficiency is. So what we've developed is new satellites in space that uh, work on a, let's call it a spot beam technology. And I reference this to almost like a flashlight. The smaller the beam is, the more concentrated it is, uh, the, the brighter that light is. Um, it's similar to what you see these uh, flashlights that the, the, the police uh, carry with them. Um, the wider the beam, the more dispersed it is, but the less penetrative uh, that light is. So this is what we've developed in space from, from new satellites. So you drive uh, 60, 60, 70% higher efficiency, which means your throughput is a lot higher. It means your total cost of ownership is reduced by 70%. So in this way, it makes it more affordable. Um, if you're looking just from a megahertz perspective, um, this is not the way that you need to look at technology or satellite technology in today's environment. So uh, we need to look at it from a consumer perspective. Um, so innovatively, since, nine, uh, since uh, uh, let's say, the last four years, we've got three epic satellites that cover Africa specifically, and that is really to drive the total cost of ownership lower. One of the other barriers I think that uh, uh, somebody may have mentioned on, on uh, one of the panelists was really the barriers to entry in terms of infrastructure. Um, we really need to get down to a modem cost that is a lot lower and much more affordable um, from an African perspective. If you're looking at $1,000 for a modem, it's just not, you, you can't afford it in Africa. So the costs of that infrastructure is getting a lot lower. The throughputs are a lot higher. Um, so you're getting a lot more for your, a lot more bang for your buck at the moment. Um, so it's become a lot more affordable, I would say, over the last three or four years, um, specifically with these technologies. Anybody else from um, the continent that, I don't know, Temidayo or Duina would like to answer that question, maybe in their country or in the region, how affordability of services is an important factor and maybe how it's overcome if it's too expensive for the end users? 
Yeah, I, I believe ultimately for a lot of communication companies, Africa is an important market for them. Um, and pricing is always uh, a major challenge. Uh, so no matter who is trying to play in the industry, it's, it's very important to develop affordable technology and services uh, for the African region. Um, there is still a lot of you know, challenges with fiber connectivity. Um, and personally, I believe you know, satellites, broadband services uh, can solve a lot of connectivity problems in Africa. But, um, until we are actually able to bring the pricing down to the lowest uh, before we're able to get the kind of penetration that we're looking for. Well, I can also make a comment uh, on that. Um, I think we need to distinguish a bit whether you want to set up a private uh, satellite connection. And of course, for that price, it's extremely relevant. And notably for companies that are operating in Africa, such as oil companies that need to have uh, secure communication like uh, in their platforms in the sea and so on. So this is an important topic, of course, where, where, where the, the direct price of the services provided by satellite or by any other means cable, uh, it's, it's an important topic, of course. But in the context of telecoms, I mean, the, the regulation across Africa in ICT, as far as the countries I know better at least, uh, there is no, no the, the, the regulation of uh, telecommunication services independently of, of the infrastructure that you use to provide the service. So this is, uh, again, not doesn't have a direct impact on the, the user. It depends a bit on the fact whether, the, or, 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 or whether the op, for the operator that is buying the service to provide uh, uh, coverage uh, to a certain region of the country is able to provide, to, to pay that price. But in this field, I would say, what, what the operator needs to sink and, and the decision is whether it is cheaper to, to install antennas all over the country and be exposed to, 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 to other risks that, that exist or uh, contract satellite communication. So this is a, a, an option of the operator and, and a question of, of, of analyzing the costs and benefits of, of each option. And at least if we are talking of fiber optical, fixed fiber optic, I'm sure satellite will be less expensive because it's very costly to build a, 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 a fiber in, in remote areas, as you can imagine. Edwina, um, is uh, Angola doing anything to uh, allow, uh, let's say, lower, lowering the barriers to entry so that pricing and uh, cost to the satellite foreign satellite operators like Intosat or Eelsat or whatever will be reduced because a lot of the cost uh, uh, I, I suspect a lot of the cost from the uh, operator apart from the infrastructure and equipment which is of course a uh, uh, cost which is uh, necessary to build the, the, the infrastructure but there are costs which are related to, to licensing as well to market entry for example and, and reg regulatory aspects. Uh, how is Angola dealing with uh, this kind of issues, for example? Well, um, I would say for now, uh, we are focused on some of the objectives that, as I said before, we are working and launching the satellite. So some of these issues, uh, I can't, I don't have an exact response um, response right now to give you at the moment. I would like to, to answer, but uh, sorry, I couldn't give you a. No, <laughs> don't worry. It, it's 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 a it's more a a thought uh, to have uh, in, in each of the countries, in, not only in Africa but anywhere in the world, that it, in order to get infrastructure in place, you you need to invest uh, also as a government, basically. Mm -hmm. That I think it's uh, also how the other panelists said it's a challenge and it's something that, uh, as in, in Angola, even uh, we are a public in the public sector, is something that we need to analyze and and um, and see in the future and um, um, taking um, about the the the, the services. Um, I think it's something that we need to to, to see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. Thank you. 
Uh, Magda, I think we are over time by 10 minutes, but if you wish to answer any more questions, there's another four or five in the, in the Q&A box. Uh, if you wish to answer one or two more, we can still do that. Uh, otherwise, we may close the session uh, as soon as possible. Okay, I will, I will try very briefly to answer to each of the questions. So the first one in the space sustainability and the debris, I think, well, this is, the question is how can this be addressed? Uh, and I believe that in this field, uh, regulation plays an important role. As you know, most regulations uh, so far or in general have not um, uh, made compulsory the, the, the best practice that have been approved by the UN and other international organizations in relation to space deb debris. This could be an option, so the regulators approving binding uh, obligations in terms of licensing launches and so on, uh, 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 this could be an option, but this would, of course, we, would generate an impact in, in, in the industry that would have uh, that will have to comply with, with those obligations uh, for, uh, in a mandatory uh, way, of course. Uh, the other question is how, um, how are, are supposed governments in Africa uh, invest while the COVID pan pandemic has caused the devastation and socioeconomic? So how, how can governments in Africa still invest in, in, in space? I, I would say, and this was the main uh, reference from my presentation, I, I would say that for, for economic rec recovery, digitalization uh, technology is extremely important. And therefore, the, the way through uh, is going through a technology, uh, electronic communications, and, sa and satellites are essential to this. So, uh, probably uh, th there is no uh, other investments in, in launching in Africa right now. This probably won't make sense since there are no available financing resources currently due to the uh, economic crisis. But using space as an enabler to the digital tra tra uh, tra transition, I think it's uh, absolutely fundamental for Africa. It's like a silver bullet. They need digitalization as much as we, we do in Europe, of course, but in Africa, and Africa has proven in, in other situations that they, they can be faster in digitalization. There are several, today I was reading uh, uh, information that Uber just launched a, a uh, e money in, in Africa and doesn't exist in, in Europe, for instance. So Africa uh, has proved that they can leapfrog ahead from, from, from Europe, at least in, in, a, in several questions. Uh, another question is how the Portuguese speaking countries are addressing the, the space. Uh, it's completely different uh, approach. So Angola, uh, Edwin has already mentioned a bit. Uh, uh, Cape Verde is also preparing, we know, a space strategy and due to their uh, extremely interesting position in terms of uh, geography, they are very well positioned to, to, to have a role in space as well. Uh, Mozambique uh, is basically looking at, uh, into the space sector uh, uh, from an electronic communication perspective, at least right now. Uh, I don't know much about uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, which is the other country that is mentioned here and I think I've covered all the questions <laughs> in a very quick way but I think I've covered all. Thank you so much uh, Magda, thank you uh, for taking all those questions all at once. Uh, let me just remind everyone that uh, we had a great panel. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, um, the panelists today uh, which have uh, made a very, very uh, great panel uh, of discussion and that we will continue having more webinars and panels over the next coming weeks. Of those that are interested, please uh, just drop me an email and I can invite you. Um, and that's it. Thank you again. Um, also for the late uh, invitation to Brian uh, and also Temidayo uh, Edwina from uh, the region uh, helping us with their point of view and Elena for uh, uh, taking the role of presenting the panel at the very beginning and also this Q&A uh, session we had earlier. Thank you so much. Goodbye and stay safe. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Yeah.